Hello, and welcome to this Analyst Angle. I'm Rob Strecce, Managing Director of the Cube Research. Today, we're gonna to talk about a set of technologies near and dear to my heart. First, the mainframe is where I started my career and became interested in application development. Second, data applications, where much of the action is today, and with AI and data apps really being fed by this data that happens to be all over organizations infrastructure, not just in the cloud. There is a lot of still traditional applications that have and are built and run very well on the mainframe. So much data still has to be accessed through these main mainframes. In light of expanding utilization of mainframes for AI ML applications, vendors have the chance to enhance their offer offerings and solidify their position by focusing on addressing specific requirements organizations are looking to leverage these technologies for. This trend is requiring organizations to further align data products with changing application development landscape as they harness the power of mainframes for cutting edge applications. Today, I'm joined by Michael Curry, president of data modernization at Rocket Software, who is gonna help me unlock understanding of what's going on on the mainframe and how applications are really being modernized and going this direction. So welcome on board, Michael. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's exciting to be here. Yeah, I, I think, again, this is like one of those things that's, like I said, near and dear to my heart is the fact that I started out actually using punch cards. That's how old I, <laughs> like, you know, been Fortran and COBOL and Pascal and all of that fun going down that path, uh, which actually the COBOL part might actually come in handy these days. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I started to look at this and, you know, when I was talking to some organizations, be it in insurance or the FIS, the financial and information, you know, insurance services industry or healthcare or a number of organizations, they have a lot of mainframes with a lot of data and they still run extremely well. But they're really looking to unlock that data for a number of different reasons, be uh, analytics, security, or really trying to modernize and bring that data into these data, different data platforms to use in AI. How are you seeing it, especially like, let's start diving into analytics. Analytics is one of those things that's really hot. Everybody talks about it. But a lot of that data is in these applications, these bespoke applications that may have been modernized or may not have been right. yet on the mainframe. What are you seeing from organizations? Yeah, most of the companies we talk to are really trying to figure out where is the best data to drive those analytics. And they're moving to more real-time analytics as opposed to sort of the static, week-old kind of uh, analytics that they've run traditionally. So the more those two things converge, the more you realize that a lot of that data that's really running the core transactions of your business still resides on the mainframe. In fact, we just did a recent survey at Rocket um, with about 200 companies around the world and one of the things we found was that less than 30% of the companies that have mainframes felt like they were fully uh, leveraging that data on the mainframe. So driving those analytic projects with that latest and greatest information that's coming off the, of the latest customer transaction, trades, and all the things that are happening in that world, um, that's really what's driving a lot of the investment that we're seeing. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things that I love about, you know, the conversation we had previously, and, you know, that's why I thought this would be great to bring to the air and, uh, you know, really get out there is the fact that organizations are looking at those analytics. And like you said, they want to be real time. And these applications are really the heart of a lot of these companies. Like you were talking about trading. Mm -hmm. I mean, these mainframes are still some of the most efficient ways to really produce these applications and to run these applications. It, that to me, also one of the things I've been hearing is really sustainability. I mean, these are really powerful machines. You talk circular economy, you can talk power and cooling. They're there, they're already bought, they can be upgraded, they can be retrofitted. What are you seeing with these organizations when they're looking at kind of, hey, how do we marry the mainframe with sustainability and what our cloud ambitions are? Yeah, I think it's sustainability is a really interesting thing because I think the initial forays into the cloud, people were thinking they were moving largely because they wanted to, a more sustainable environment. They wanted to be able to use only what they needed and, and that sort of ability to scale up and scale down was something that you only got when you invested in the, in the cloud. 
Um, and now I think there's a, a bit of a reawakening around that. And I think a lot of the people that are running those core uh, mainframe type systems have found that they're actually quite green, right? They they run in, in a fairly compact space that so you don't have to keep replacing uh, them on an ongoing basis. Um, you know, their energy profiles are quite good. So we do see that there are, you know, a lot of efforts around su sustainability that are focused on keeping the mainframes around for the things they do well, right? Uh, and I think that will continue over time. It, it doesn't mean that people aren't moving stuff to the cloud because there's things that you could do in the cloud that are very, you know, not really well suited for the mainframe. But when you're talking about those vertically scaling, high performance, um, high transactionality type uh, applications where you just really can't have accounts be out of sync, you can't wait for eventual consistency and things like that. You really want to do that stuff in a mainframe type environment, something that ver vertically scales well and has that transactional integrity all the time. And I, I think you, you hit on a really good topic that kind of ties these two first topics together with the analytics and sustainability and cloud and what doing the right work in the right place. Yeah. What? How, how do you see organizations really looking to bring the data to cloud for analytics, for it to mesh, you know, kind of do the data mesh thing mm -hmm. with mainframe as being a piece of that. Yeah, it's actually a really interesting shift. So um, what's happening really on the mainframe side is those transactional systems, people had started to move them off or tried to move them off and they realized there's a core set of those applications that are gonna be there at least for a long time, if not forever. Um, some people are moving them off successfully, but a lot of those really make sense to run there just because of the, the qualities of service you get on the mainframe side. Uh, but as they start to realize that all of the analytics and the AI projects that are happening, in uh, those are all happening in the cloud, how do I bridge those two worlds together, right? So what they're really doing is figuring out how do I create data products? And you talked about data mesh. One of the key elements of data, of data mesh is this idea of data products, right? And having ownership by a team that really understands the all the you know intricacies of a mainframe based transactional system and how they work and what data is there they can produce data products that the rest of the business can consume so being able to translate the technical um, you know world of the mainframe which is you know relatively arcane in some some cases you were mentioning cobol and other things cobol's not so bad but some of the things that live in those worlds are quite uh, old and, and there's just not a lot of people that know them, right? Uh, but translating that into these sort of modern uh, data formats and, and modern data systems and bringing the metadata along with it so that you really have a complete understanding of the data that you're looking at and making it easily integratable into, you know, data lakes and lake houses and, um, you know, sort of the, the data pipelines that people are building so that you're not sacrificing all of that new technology and innovation while you're sticking with your your uh, transactional systems that are running on the mainframe. Yeah, I, I think to me that that is the the biggest piece of it is how do you bring all of these worlds together? And like you said, I mean, again, everybody said the mainframe was dead like 20 years ago, no less, you know, now. And I, I think what we're finding is that, hey, you can go run containers there. You you can run Linux, you can run, by the way, it was, it there was virtualization on the mainframe, you know, far before there was virtualization on servers and VMware was the thing. That's right, yeah. So I, I think, again, where where do you see customers really pushing in on this? Like, you, you, you brought it up that, hey, certain things, they, they, they are, mo mo you know, modernizing and, bring, and taking to the cloud. Yep. Where, where do you see the things that, hey, you know, it really just doesn't make sense. And they're, they're actually building those bridges together. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of those core transactional systems, right? I mean, if you think about a, a, a lot of people call them legacy systems, and, and that unfortunately has taken on a negative connotation, right? But that legacy is important. And when you think about it as a legacy, right, that is your legacy. Um, if you think about all the investments that have gone into that over the years, uh, we work with a, a government cu a customer in Australia that has 30 years of legislation built into that application, all the decisions that are made about what they're, how they're, they're uh, going to make decisions within uh, their payments processes, all the things that they're thinking about, those things are built into this system. They're codified. And so to, to unwind that, to try to find something to replace it or to try to rebuild that, it's, it's very difficult. It's very high risk. And it, you know, ultimately, you're going to have something that probably doesn't scale as well and might not reflect all of those things that, you've, that are really business requirements. So 
I think that's what we're seeing is when, when you need to keep that sort of history of the decisions you've made and you want to recapture and leverage the investment that you've made in that logic over all that, that period of time, that's when you really want to keep those applications on the mainframe, um, especially when they really benefit from the scalability, the security, the vertical scaling um, benefits of, of the mainframe. Yeah, and I, I think, again, back to you, the study you did, and I saw one from IBM as well, that like 68% of the world's transactions still at some point go through a mainframe yep. system. And I, I think that's, the, you know, we... I know it's not sexy to talk about three-tier applications and all, because everybody wants to be microservices and all of that. But when you start to look at the different tiers and where things live, are you seeing organizations leaning into more, hey, yeah, I'm going to have it call back here. I want, I want to build, I'm going to have stuff in Colo. I'm going to have stuff in cloud to that. I'm going to build the microservices front end. I'm going to use some security up there and keep that and try to, kind of almost tear it back to the mainframe. Is that where you see organizations doing a lot? Yeah, I really see that across the, the entire data fabric that they're building. They're, they're thinking about the mainframe as being just a set of key resources for data. And sort of, as I mentioned before, sort of building those data products. We also see it though, just across the whole DevOps chain, right? If you think about how people develop uh, new products and, and a lot of those are um, things that are, might be customer facing, like new applications that are built for customers. They, they just are now trying to be, uh, be able to tie together the DevOps processes and the tool chains that they use so that it's seamless across the cloud and the mainframe. And that becomes really critical to make sure that you can very quickly bring people up to speed uh, that are coming out of college and make them productive and reduce the learning curve, right? Um, and also keep every, everything productive on an ongoing basis. You're not, you don't have these itches where you're trying to translate from one DevOps chain to another. And so that you see a lot of investment around that as well. Yeah, and I was going to say that, I mean, Rocket's not just about, hey, we're going to slap some APIs on top of the mainframe. That you, you can do that, sure. but that's not what you're really focused on. It's more on, hey, how do you bring cloud native as close as possible, right? That's right. And that's what we think of as true modernization, right? Modernization without disruption. That's what we always say. It's really bringing the technologies that have been very different on the mainframe side, closer to the technologies that are being used in the cloud today, which are very productive. They allow you to innovate much faster and they allow you to take advantage of some of the newer capabilities that are emerging from different vendors that are, have formed these new ecosystems. So we wanna be able to have those two worlds live seamlessly together and that's what we see as modernization. Yeah, I, I think a big piece of it that you know we touched on and you kind of just actually went there a little bit with the whole data products and the metadata, is really governance and kind of security. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody, you know, looks at, hey, well, what's behind the firewall is really safe. And I, I think that's kind of gone out the window with the way ransomware. But I, again, you don't hear a lot about people talking about the securing of their mainframe these days. But what are you seeing in that space as well? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, there's there's a, a lot happening because the demands of, especially AI, have really driven, like everybody wants the data, right? So you'll have people that are moving data off of the mainframe and just bulk movement to get it into a cloud uh, place, a data lake or something where they can actually do all kinds of AI type training and analytics against that data. And the, the problem with that is you've now taken it out of this very secure, very controlled environment. You've put it someplace where Developers have access to it. You know, it potentially could leak out. We've seen a lot of that in the news lately. Um, so you don't want to necessarily just do that, right? You have to be smarter about how you're going to make these worlds coexist. So as much as possible, you want to retain the security characteristics of where the data lives today. Let me give you a really good example. So we have a lot of customers that are really looking to take advantage of their unstructured data that lives on the mainframe. So think about this as sort of operational unstructured data primarily. Things like um, your customer statements if you're a bank, right? Most most banks, you you uh, if you're probably your bank, you go online. If you want to see what your account looked like last year in September, you've got to go search, pull up an actual statement um, from last September and, and look through it. And so uh, that those are documents that are stored on the mainframe generally. And so what we're finding is uh, the companies really want to be able to take those documents and use them in a generative AI setting. 
but it's they can't just pull those out and stick them into S3 buckets or something and run AI against it. They can't. It's just too risky. They're, they're currently controlled by these policies for access control and um, you know data residency and and um, all different things around the life life cycle of that data. And so what they really want to be able to do is keep all those controls and policies in place, but be able to apply generative AI to it. So they can do things like question answering. So you don't have to search for that that statement. You can just ask a question. So, you know, tell me what my my balance was last September or how many payments I made to this vendor and automatically be able to use the the controls and policies that have been put in place around those documents to make sure that they remain safe. That's the bridge that we like to provide for our customers. Yeah. And I, I think it's key, right? I think when you start to get in, you know, like you talk about Gen AI and, you know, uh, I, I like to call it instead of legacy, I call it heritage. Heritage. I, I like heritage. It. I, like I use it. heritage, you know, because I mean, again, it's 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 what the companies were founded on those applications. Right. It's also AI, you know, before it became Gen AI was, you know, we were doing a lot of different analysis. And like you were talking about, a lot of those organizations are trying to push into, hey, we now have unlocked this. So you're helping them bridge that gap, keep kind of the metadata and governance layers and security together so that they can really, you know, deal with things. Because especially if uh, you have to deal with uh, the SEC or something like that, like GLBA and then right. get over into Europe, it's GDPR and CCPA in California and VACCPA or whatever the hell it is in Virginia. <laughs> All the alphabet soup of different you know, privacy. Yeah. But I mean, again, the last thing you want to be is in the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times as a headline that says, hey, by the way, this leaked out. And, you know, it's because they did some hack and, you Absolutely. know, got the data or get the fines. Right. That's the other part of it. Well, fines are huge these days. Yeah. Well, that's the yeah, especially the tech companies are finding that out that it's uh, <laughs> not as much fun. Having been on that side of the fence and had a, a lot of mainframes when I was at Manual Life and John Hancock, I can tell you that the SEC sending you a, a, a a, a let back in the day, it was a letter in, in the mail that certified that that is not the thing you want to see on a Monday morning, yeah, to say the least. You don't want to open your mailbox to no, that. <laughs> no, definitely not. And I, I think one of the things that really, you know, kind of kind of to bring this all together is how are you seeing them lean into Gen AI with the data that they can pull? Because it would seem like there's so much data and I, I've talked to some financial services and they're they're looking at how they again, keep those governance models and really keep it secure yeah. uh, and have person, you know, in the loop kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing a lot of that with how the pipelines are you're helping to set those customers up with? Absolutely. Yeah. The two big areas of spend on Gen AI that I'm seeing in the market are on customer service and internal employee productivity. Those are the two big, big areas, right? And um, and the customer service side, most of it isn't customer facing necessarily. So take the advantage of the, the example of the um, statements I just talked about for banks. Take your, your um, bank statements and enable you, your customers to be able to ask questions against them. We see a lot of banks, instead of doing that directly to customers, having their customer service reps be the interface. Right. So if somebody calls in and says, you know, I want to know what, you know, where, what was my um, interest rate last year and, and how much has it gone up? They can just very simply ask answer that question. You know, they can use uh, unstructured sort of question answering to be able to answer questions, and it pulls back the evidence. Um, so that gives you a little bit of a buffer around concerns around you know um, hallucinations in the models and and those types of things. Um, and then on the customer or the uh, employee um, uh, productivity side, a lot of it's about like I have questions about our company policy for for something or. I need to be able to see the legal documents associated with something uh, in order to do some research or to figure out what my liability is or whatever it is. And, and being able to provide the, an interface that lets people just ask questions or see summaries of this unstructured information without actually letting it out into the wild, keeping those controls in place you were talking about, that's critical. Yeah, and, and we're seeing it as well that, uh, again, when like you were talking about, you know, cloud is an operating model, it's not a place. Yep. And it, bringing it as close as you can to the mainframe where the data is, because, you know, data has gravity, it has weight, you know, bringing it all the way up and down and having multiple copies, then you have to have governance all over everything and just gets really complicated really quickly. That's right. Well, hey, thank you for coming on board today. I really appreciate this because I think, again, this is an area and a corner 
of the entire ecosystem that I don't think people really think about all that often. And I know we are. Uh, we actually have some research going in this area, and we I, I think you know I'll have you back on when we uh, when we get that done, and we can uh, chat about that because I think again it, you're, you're you guys see it from a different perspective about this modernization and how to bring cloud to the mainframe. It to me is is to, totally you know a, a game changer in how organizations have to think. So thank you for coming on board. Yeah, thank you. I look forward to the research you're going to be doing. Yep. And thank you for watching this Analyst Angle here on The Q, the leader in analysis and news from technology perspective. Take care and stay tuned.